What's good, everybody? My guest today is Evan Macedo. And Evan, did I pronounce that right? Is Macedo? Is that how you pronounce it? Oh, yeah. It? Nice, good old Portuguese name, Macedo. <laughs> I love it. Evan Macedo, who is an unusual guest as it pertains to the title. So just bear with me and I'll tell you why he's here. He's the treasurer at Sapers in Wallach, which, among other things, advises venture and private equity backed companies on how to structure executive compensation and benefits packages, which, of course, is why I invited him on because most of you who are listening um, are either in a private equity or a venture backed uh, technology company, likely over $100 million in revenue. And I wanted Evan to come on to talk a little bit about the executive benefits packages uh, that he helps those kinds of companies with. Evan, welcome to the Goats of Growth. Thank you, Jay. It's a pleasure to be here. As somebody who does my own podcasting show, it is great to step out and be a guest on someone else's show for once. Yeah, I say the same thing, believe me, on the other side of the mic, as they say. <laughs> um, <laughs> so tell me a little bit about Sapers and Wallach, but specifically why having the right executive benefits package is critical for attracting and retaining talent, the best talent. Sure. So quickly, Sapers and Wallach has been around for 90 years. Uh, I know I look pretty young for, you know, over 90. So uh, doing pretty good there. But for vampire. Uh, we are three generations deep. So we've been doing this for a very, very long time. Um, and we are a financial services business in the heart of Newton, Massachusetts. Um, but we do a few different things. One, we are designing and implementing executive benefit plans. We are one of the top 100 retirement plan advisors in the country. Um, we are helping with executive benefits and business insurances. And then on the individual side, we have a growing wealth management practice and sophisticated life insurance practice. So over the years, we've kind of built this one-stop shop for both corporations and individuals, financial services, uh, and employee benefit needs. That's awesome. Thanks for that. That uh, that summary and context. So let me just let's just use a case study, I guess, if you will, right? a, a fictitious uh, case study. Um, tech company under a hundred million dollars in revenue. They're hiring a CRO, Chief Revenue Officer, uh, after the last one walked away, just at about a year. Let's just say, right? Um, how would this company go about offering a competitive executive benefits package? that would have incentivized that person to have stayed longer. Uh, but then also, you know, let's say for instance, they call someone like me uh, to help them recruit that CRO. And I feel confident and excited that uh, the benefits package is something that's, that I can go to market with that people are gonna be excited about. Well, that is a great question, Jay. And before I answer it, I wanna start with the last person left, what did it do to the company? One, it's a huge disruption to the whole management staff. They, they now have to take their eye off the ball, off their goals to replace somebody immediately. Number two, in the eyes of the clients, you know, it's definitely going to disrupt that and it's going to give a bad image to the company, which you absolutely want to avoid. And three, you have to hire an executive uh, search firm such as yourself. That's going to cost money and there's going to be a lot of money to train someone. And typically it's somewhere between three to six months, uh, I would say, until someone is somewhat <laughs> up to speed on their role. So you're losing a lot of time in a very, very important role. So you want to make sure you're avoiding that. Um, and to avoid that, you want to make sure you're incentivizing your key employees in the right way. So we put in executive benefit package to attract, retain, and reward your key employees. And that's exactly what you would want to do in this position. Now, first, what I would do is I'd kind of figure out what the management's goals are with this position. You know, are they a tech company where they want to maybe try to uh, position the company for a sale in three to five years? Because we can come up with some three to five year plans. You know, one thing that uh, we like to do there is a rolling bonus plan. With a rolling bonus plan, you know, you give somebody a bonus each year and you can put a vesting schedule on it. Maybe they get 20% year one, another 20% year two, and so on and so forth. Um, but when they get their bonus the next year, the vesting schedule starts all over again. So each year, there, there's 
they were all they're always going to leave money on the table if they were to leave. Uh, so they'll think twice about it. And if it's significant bonuses, after you're getting two, three, four, five years of those, and they're all starting to vest, well, hey, that's a much larger number, um, and someone's not going to want to lose that. Uh, Let me ask you this. Oh, yep. Go, yep, go, continue. Go, continue. I was going to say have... the other option is maybe your company like Sabres and Wallach, uh, you've been around for many, many years, and you have someone that's been fantastic, they're a rainmaker, they're a key management um, executive, uh, and you want them to stay till retirement. We can design different types of executive retirement plans with vesting schedules um, mm -hmm. that have a longer horizon. Um, or, you know, we do things like a live or die bonus plan uh, that's backed with a life insurance component. So, you know, if you stay till retirement, you'll get a large amount of money um, put aside for you for your retirement to fund it. Or if you were to pass away too soon, um, that life insurance proceeds would then go to your family uh, to still take care of them and protect them. So that's another popular thing uh, that executives and companies like when they're trying to have someone stay until retirement. Let me ask you this as it pertains to the live or die bonus plan. And maybe it's not a situation where it's a, a legacy company, let's just say, or a, a company that's been around for a while. But let's just say it's a company that is, um, let's say it's a private equity backed company. Uh, the founders are still very much involved in the day-to-day -day operations. And the company, to your earlier point, wants to position it to sell in three to five years. What about that live or die benefits package for the founders at the acquisition from the private equity firm to say, like, you know, let's say, for instance, they get hit by a bus or somebody gets hit by a bus. Um, how, is, is that, how, how would that work? In other words, where would that, how would that be structured? So, you know, if, if there's a founder and I'm investing in a company, we're, mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to change gears a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'd be looking at key person insurance. Okay. So, so that's different. the founder, or maybe you're like a data scientist and you're the one that has all the knowledge in your head on how to develop a certain type of a product. You can't just go snap your fingers and replace that person on a drop of a dime. It's going to take time. It's going to be a long drawn out search. You're going to, you might, you know, lose some revenue in that time because you're trying to find someone. So what we would do is set up a key person policy. And usually when investors are investing two, three, four, five million plus, uh, they're going to want, it's usually going to be in the contract. They're going to want a key person policy on the key people, which typically is going to be the CEO of the company and maybe somebody that is like the idea research person. Um, and, you know, key person insurance, if you use term policies, they're relatively cheap. Um, so it's pretty affordable and you can easily get, you know, several million dollars for, for a lower cost. Where do most companies go wrong when they're thinking of their benefits, um, executive benefits packages? Where, where, when you sit down with companies and are, are advising them, either through questions that they have or just current challenges or past challenges that they've, that they've had. What are the commonalities? What do you think they mostly get hung up on? Uh, I would say number one is a lack of communication. You know, companies spend a lot of money to put fantastic benefits in place, but they are not sending annual statements to show how, you know, their retirement programs are growing. Um, and they're really not showing their employees the, the benefits of why they're there in the first place. Maybe you have some turnover in HR and the new people coming in just do not understand the programs uh, as well as the previous people did. So if you hire a company like Sapers and Wallach, we do a lot of that communication for the HR departments, for the executive teams. It's very important that you're communicating it. Um, and then we will also meet with the participants one on one to go talk about their own personal uh, plans in place and answer any questions they may have. So that is communication is like the number one thing. And then I would say number two is you're not putting in a benefit that actually means something to someone. Uh, you could have like a young person, say mid thirties, and you could create this live or die bonus plan for them, but Hey, they're in their thirties. They might not want to stay at that company. 
actually let's go someone in their 40s say they or 50s say they have kids going to college what is what is the biggest concern of every parent in every parent's mind when they have kids going to college affording them afford affording college affording college so you know they're going to be incentivized not for their retirement they're going to be incentivized to how can i come up with the money to pay for college for my children so we designed something over here called a keep plan it's meant again to keep someone there for that three to five year mark and what you could do and just just an idea we've employed at other places is say you have a child they're going to be going to college in first child's going to college in two years we could put in a plan in place that says, you know, once your child goes to college, we'll pay $25,000 towards their tuition. Um, and then say they have two more kids uh, and the kids are spaced two years apart. Maybe the next kid will say, we'll give you 40,000 for that kid. And then the third child will give you 60,000. So they're gonna have something material that if they walk away, it'll be painful to walk away from. And that's kind of what you want to put in place to get people to stay. You want something that is easy to administer and it'll it'll cause a pain if they were to look somewhere else. Is there a more or a most, I don't know, that's the right term, but is there a most uh, popular executive benefits package like something that or or something within the benefits package that um you know, is, is, is a no-brainer for companies to, to offer? Uh, that's a loaded question. They're all no-brainers depending on what kind of goal you're trying to accomplish. Um, you know, I know what we've been talking about benefit plans to retain employees, but here's one that is meant to attract employees, and it's a little bit different from the rest. Uh, we call it the SARP concept, which stands for Supplemental Alternative Retirement Program. Uh, it uses a life insurance chassis, but instead of buying a large death benefit, you buy the smallest death benefit um, for the amount of money. And then that puts it inside of an insurance wrapper. So when you're putting money in it year over year, that's growing tax free. And it's kind of like a Roth 401k lookalike. Um, it's usually good when someone has at least a 10 year time horizon before they get to retirement because eventually the earnings in the policy and it's a permanent policy. So there's cash value there. The earnings in the policy will outweigh the cost of insurance at some point. So somebody has to have a longer time horizon. But what this does is when you're maxing out your 401k plan, you can put in 22,500 per year. Or if you're over uh, 50 and a half, you can put in $30,000 per year, but say you're, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Big Executive making three hundred, six hundred thousand dollars a year. Well, that twenty two thousand five hundred that you're putting away isn't going to be enough to put away for your retirement if you want to live the lifestyle that you want in retirement. So by putting it in one of these uh, Roth lookalike plans, you're uh, essentially accomplishing the same thing. And the added bonus that I would add to it is uh one there's no governmental restrictions on these like you have like a retirement plan you have to wait till you're 50 59 and a half to take out money you don't have to do that with these types of plans so say you have a daughter that's getting married and you need to pull a little bit of money out of this you could uh say you're we just had a big storm yesterday say a tree crushed your car you need to buy a new car and you need to you need a source to pull money from you could do it without any of the uh you know, retirement plan and restrict uh, penalties there. So that's also a good benefit. And one last thing that I'll say about it, uh, which people also really like, is instead of the corporation owning it for these uh, SARP plans or supplemental alternative retirement plans, the individual owns it. So, you know, when they leave the company at some point, it's something that they can take with them. But this is something that a lot of companies do not have in place. Um, we find it very popular with medical practices, dental practices, legal practices, uh, places that have, you know, a large group of highly compensated individuals, um, you know, scientists, like research firms. So if you're a company that falls within that realm and you're looking for something to kind of maximize retirement savings above and beyond what your typical are 
401k plans can do, this is something to absolutely consider. What about on the flip side? Let's say you're an incoming um, executive. Let's say that's a CRO, right? You're the new CRO that's coming into the um, the case study that we're talking about now. Um, what should they plan to negotiate or or should negotiate in their executive package that might not necessarily what would would, would would be offered but isn't necessarily offered outright i guess if you will right it's like it's 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 something a company would offer but they're just not offering now kind of like a nice restaurant that has bread but you have to ask for it in order to get it <clears throat> yeah you know that's a good question it makes me think of uh some like something else <clears throat> uh your disability uh policy for your company I don't know if you know how most disability policies work within a group policy, but usually there's a cap. So say that your disability plan says you get 60, say you were to go to a long-term disability, you would get 60% of whatever your income is. Um, now that sounds great, but what if you're making $400,000? Uh, well, a lot of these group plans have a cap on the plan. So, you know, I was talking to a company over the summer uh, they had a disability cap of $6,000 per month. So that means if you're making above $120,000, you're not going to be getting that true 60,000, I mean, that true 60% um, in disability. And that's going to present a big problem. Number one, you have a big time executive at a company, uh, something happens, they're not covered as well as they thought they were. Number mm -hmm. two, if that wasn't communicated properly and they think they're getting 60%, um, you might have a lawsuit on your hands. In three, we see this as well. Someone's spouse can always come back to say, my spouse spent 25, 30 years working for you. You know, they were backing out of their driveway. They got hit by a car. They're on disability now and we cannot make ends meet. We have to sell our assets. You need to do something to take care of that person. So what is a company going to do at that point? Are they going to risk a lawsuit or are they going to say, you know what, we'll make this, we'll, we'll pay this person some money, but then that negates the uh, insurance policy. And now you're just setting a precedent that you might have to do so for someone else in the future. So that gets a little messy. So I would definitely kind of look at what are the limits on your disability policy. Also look at what the limits are on the life insurance policy. Cause sometimes it's, you know, you might have two or three times salary, but it's capped at a number. So again, mm -hmm. if you're making 400,000 and it's a two times salary uh, benefit that you might think you're getting 800,000, but maybe it's really capped at 350 or something. So those would be the first things that I would look at coming into a company is, you know, do those limits align with what I feel like I'm going to need for myself and my family for the next 10 years or until retirement? And two, you know, I would want something that's going to want to keep me there. I'm not going to want to go start a new career at another person again and again, especially as you get later on in life. Um, so if there's some kind of executive retirement plan that can be put in place uh, that'll keep you there. Those are the two things I'd be trying to negotiate for. And if anyone is looking for ways on, you know, if they want to put a more a couple more arrows in their quiver before they go into a negotiation like that, um, you know, that's something that we've kind of given them ideas for as well. What about ne negotiating the rolling portions of the rolling bonus plan? In other words, getting more earlier, I guess, or um, I don't know, just trying to get creative here. <clears throat> you know, these things can all be designed however a company might want it. Uh, a company might want to try to keep everything in line for a certain criteria or category of employee. Yeah. Um, but if you are a really important position, you really could negotiate anything. You could negotiate trying to get equity into the company as well or negotiate getting some phantom stock. Another thing that I see is somebody puts in all this work, the company sells, they don't get a piece of the sale, and then there's other people in the mix and they're out of a job. So if you think that you're going to join a company where you might, uh, they might be looking to kind of do a sale, you might want to start thinking, well, how can I put something in paper uh, in place today? So if that were to happen, 
you know, I have something to work towards. And that'll actually make someone work smarter and a lot harder to grow um, the revenue of the company, grow the multiple of the company. So that way you can have, you know, a better chance of success and maybe a little bit more profit at the end of the day uh, in general. I love it. Is there anything that's unreasonable? I think a lot of times people are reticent to negotiate something. Let's say if, again, using the CRO as an example, they're reticent to negotiate something because they're afraid that <clears throat> it's going to turn the offer sideways or I don't know, something, leave a bad uh, taste in the mouth. Have you heard, heard or do you know of sort of unreasonable expectations from um, an incoming um, employee that maybe someone should at least be mindful of, even if they want to go there? <clears throat> um, I would say it all depends on the company. You know, you, you, you need to do your homework on the company and figure out what capacity do they have? You know, what mm -hmm. are the other players where if they do something specific for you, is that going to be, are they going to have to do it for other people? Um, you know, a lot of times when we're designing these programs, we're working with the executives of the company uh, and the manage and the owners of the company to design it for their for their C-suite executives or management team. So mm -hmm. we're mostly working with those people to design something that meets the company goals. Mm -hmm. um, so that's if, if there's a conflict between the company goal and the employees goal, hey, maybe it's not a right fit. Maybe. Maybe you got to keep looking for your job search until you find the right kind of fit for you. You know, it's it costs way too much money to make a bad hire and choose the wrong company. Um, and I always think it's worth doing more due diligence up front so you know it's going to be a more long term investment for both people. That's a great place to end it. Do, 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 do diligence, do more due diligence, um, because you're right. It's costly on both sides, whether it's you're the employer or the employee for sure. Ready to get into the rapid fire five, where I ask you five questions, give me five quick answers, and then we'll go into the bonus question where I will ask you a question that came from a previous guest, and then you can think of a question, could be personal, could be uh, professional that you would like for me to ask my next guest, whoever that might be. Sure, Jay. I'll say far away. <laughs> right. There you go. I like it. Uh, number one, what motivates you? Uh, you know, I wake up every day <laughs> helping people. You know, what motivates me is to get out of bed, find somebody that I can solve their problem for. We have a lot of people that are worried about retirement. They don't know how to do it when we can put together a plan in place and show them that they're going to be not just like, okay, but they're going to be doing very well when they get to retirement, the load of stress that you can see it in their face, the load of stress that comes off of their uh, shoulders when they, when they have that answer, it's, it, it is a really, really great feeling. And people live their entire lives, not knowing how to get there. Um, so to be able to kind of, be the person that can create that feeling for someone, let them know, give them the peace of mind in their head that, hey, I can live the kind of life that I want to, or I know how to live the life within my means because we had this conversation. It's just a real, my, my hair actually is standing up in my head talking about this, but it is just a really good feeling when you get to do that for somebody. And that's why I get up every day. That's why I work really hard to build this company, to do what we're doing, because it's just a really wonderful thing what we do. It's fantastic. Name a big goal you have right now, and when would you like to accomplish it? Um, it's an ongoing goal, but I have worked really hard to spend a lot of time interviewing lots of people over the past, uh, I want to say, three to four years, trying to hire <clears throat> the right people for the right managerial advisory positions. And then um, I would say as of the beginning of last year, we have been hiring uh, a lot of uh, younger up and comers, um, which is very exciting because being a third generation business, uh, one of my goals is to help build the fourth generation of advisors here. And that's not something that you, most companies never make it to the fourth generation. Um, mm -hmm. So in my mind, that is a very exciting uh, job that I've been tasked with. And we're doing lots of training to all of our young up and comers and they're doing well. Uh, 
and they're growing their knowledge and successes. So it's really great to kind of see how that's been developing. What's your most preferred way to learn new information and to stay sharp? <clears throat> um, I have, I like to learn through multiple sources. One, you know, there's white papers that come out on new laws and regulations. Um, number two, like you, I have a podcast called Radio Entrepreneurs, and I love to have CPAs on, attorneys on to talk about what's going on with the, with the market and new regulations. Ask them questions that maybe you might not see in writing um, and have more of like a dialogue. I, I belong to a group called USA 500, which is all trusted advisors around the Boston area. And that's also an area where we can ask you know, a whole table full of uh, lawyers, what would you do in this situation? What would you do in that situation? What are the things you should think of? So I really, you know, it's, it's good to have the white papers to get the base knowledge, but I really like, you know, the hands-on interaction um, to really take it to the next level. How many hours of sleep do you average per night? Not enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably six. Six. Uh, if yeah. I could have a little bit more, that would be nice. But, you know, I got my whole regiment in place. It works really well. Uh, it makes me happy. So uh, try to catch up a little bit more on the weekends when I can. <laughs> yeah. uh, what's your favorite thing to do when you aren't working, perhaps on the weekends? Well, I am an avid boater. I have a uh, little motorboat on Lake Winnipesaukee. And... I catch somewhere between two to 300 fish a year wow. up there. So <laughs> as a Portuguese guy, I love fishing. I grew up fishing. Um, so I like to take people out, enjoy the sun. It just, it, it's, it is my most relaxing feeling uh, out of the whole year, just being out there, peace and quiet, um, and just kind of decompress from my work week. It sounds serene. For sure. Sounds serene. Um, what would what question would you like for me to ask my next guest? <clears throat> well, I have a favorite question that I ask all the people that we interview for our company. Okay. And it is a question that really gets me to know who they are uh, and really gets them. If they haven't smiled during an interview, it gets them to smile and talk about what their own passions are. But I always like to ask, you know, Tell me something about yourself that I cannot learn from reading your resume, your LinkedIn, or anything on the internet. Tell me something about yourself that I cannot learn from learning. Reading looking your at resume LinkedIn. is what I usually ask. Yep. Yes. Yep. Awesome. And people seem to like have a nice glow on when they answer that question. And they'll talk about, this is what I really love doing. This was what I grew up doing, and it really kind of gets you to know a little bit more about them that you wouldn't have known uh, prior to that. Anything that you were told that sort of surprised you or floored you or knocked you off your seat or, I don't know, something that was just <laughs> completely out of left field that you were like, whoa, I'm not hiring this person? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm not going to repeat what people yeah. have said, just, you know, for confidentiality reasons. Mm -hmm. However... Um, when I ask that question and somebody has an answer that is, has nothing to do with the job and, you know, you can tell where their, their interest might be in a whole nother, another different industry. At that point, it's like, you know, you might be better off going in that industry because you're going to be a little bit happier, a little bit more motivated throughout your career. Um, and maybe this might not be the right fit, but for people where I ask that question, and they had a mentor that was an uncle or a father that was in wealth management and they want to help people because they have a good story about something that happened. You know, it really helps to differentiate who wants to be in the industry and who doesn't want to be in the industry. And that's the biggest thing that I get out of that question. Oh, very interesting. Cool. Glad I asked that follow up. Okay. Here is the bonus question that came from my last guest. <clears throat> So here it is. It's kind of heavy. So if you believe in reincarnation, what would you like to come back as in your next life? Um, that's a good question. 
I mean, I think to be some type of a eagle or a hawk, something that, you know, I think flying is a real, must be an amazing feeling to be able to do. Um, I, that's something I would come back as, uh, cause I think it would just be really neat to experience something that us as humans don't ever get to experience on a day-to-day -day basis. It's interesting. Eagle is always the thing that comes to my mind when I think of, I equate Eagle with freedom and just sort of, I don't know. Yeah. Freedom actually, I guess. Uh, America. Which, I was going to say, which makes sense given, <laughs> given the fact that it's our, it's our bird. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, how can folks reach out to you to thank you, um, get in touch with you, maybe ask a question that I didn't ask, um, perhaps maybe even come to work for you? What's the best way for, for them to do that? Easiest way is to go to our website. It's sapers wallacom You can go to our team page, see me, read my bio, my LinkedIn's on it, and my contact information is on it. I'd highly recommend... Um, you just checking it out and I'd be very happy whether you're a company or you're an individual, I'd be very happy to have a conversation with you, see what your goals are, see what makes sense and figure out how we can help you to get there. And we'll make sure that we put the details of that in the show notes. Um, Evan Macedo, thank you for joining the goats of growth today. Absolutely. Pleasure to be here. Goodbye, everybody. Don't forget to subscribe rate and review if you haven't already will help the show a lot. Thank you. Till next time.